Welcome to the Project Management Prepcast, helping you prepare for the PMP exam. Here's your instructor, Cornelius Fichtner. Hello and welcome back to part two on our lesson on human resource management theory. I'm your instructor, Cornelius Fichtner. In part one, we looked at a number of topics in regards to organizational structure, power, conflict and team development. Right now, here in part two, we are moving on to motivation and many, many theories around the motivational concepts. So the question we ask is, what motivates us to perform? In our own lives and projects, we see that there are some people who are much more motivated to work hard than others. In ourselves, sometimes we see the same thing. We apply ourselves 110% to a task, while other times we drag our feet to do a simple task. Is it differences in personalities? Are some people just predisposed to achieving more? Or is it how we are managed or raised as children? Or is it up to those around us to bring out the best performance in us? Or perhaps there is more something basic to this that is hardwired into our brains at some level as humans. We're all motivated the same way. When we discuss motivation, it is difficult not to get into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow tried to explain commonalities that he observed in his research. Maslow proposed that we, as humans, have basic needs which we seek to satisfy. But once our most basic needs are met, then we focus on satisfying successively higher needs. Let's take a look at that theory. So the hierarchy of needs is a theory in psychology that Abraham Maslow proposed in his 1943 paper, A Theory of Human Motivation. He proposed that different needs fall within a hierarchy, which, by the way, he didn't arrange into a pyramid in his original work, but it is often depicted as one now consisting of five levels. The first four levels at the base of the pyramid are grouped together as deficiency needs or D needs, which are associated with physiological needs which may manifest in a physical way or cause a lot of tension. He proposes that we first need to fulfill these deficiency needs in order to be self-actualized. The fifth level at the top of the pyramid, growth needs. Maslow coined the term meta motivation to describe the motivation of self-actualized people to seek fulfillment above the basic needs in order to reach their full potential. So the main concept is that the higher needs in this hierarchy only come into focus once all the needs at the lower level in the pyramid are mainly or entirely satisfied. So let's take a look at examples of what we find in Maslow's hierarchy. The first level at the bottom is physiological needs. There is the need to breathe, the need for food to eat, for water to drink. The second level on the pyramid is safety. You need the security of the body, the need for shelter, and for the body not to be physically harmed. There is also security in employment and the security of the ability in getting the resources that you require. The third level is love and belonging, and is sometimes also called social. This includes friendship, family, and other relationships. Next in the hierarchy are the esteem or status needs. You need to have self-esteem and confidence to be able to respect yourself and get recognition for achievements and reach a level of achievement to gain the respect of others and be respected by others. And finally, the fifth level at the very top of the pyramid Self-actualization. Self-actualization is the instinctual need of humans to make the most of their unique abilities and to strive to be the best that they can be. This means to be moral, creative, spontaneous, solve problems and so on. 
self-actualization is the most important one in this pyramid for us because as humans and as project managers you are striving for self-actualization and so are your project team members so if you see a pmp exam sample question that asks you what are we ultimately trying to achieve with human resources on our projects then self-actualization is a good answer maslow's hierarchy of needs is not all there is in regards to the topic of motivation in this area you don't actually need to know your a b c's instead you need to know your x y's and z's that is because there is a theory x y and even a theory z or z theory x and y are two contrasting models of human motivation developed by Douglas MacGregor in the 1960s. They describe two very different attitudes towards workforce motivation. MacGregor felt that companies followed either one of these two approaches. For you as a project manager it is important to understand these theories so that you know which theory your organization and team members follow. Only then can you adopt your management and leadership style accordingly. In Theory X, management assumes that employees are inherently lazy and will avoid work and responsibility wherever they can. A Theory X worker dislikes the job and career and because of this, workers need to be closely supervised and comprehensive systems of control are developed. A hierarchical structure is needed with narrow span of control at each level. According to this theory, employees will show little ambition without an exciting incentive program and will avoid responsibility wherever they can. A Theory X manager adopts a more authoritarian style based on the threat of punishment of employees. This makes sense as he or she believes that employees do not really want to work, that they would much rather avoid responsibility and that it is the manager's job to structure the work and energize the employees. Theory Y, on the other hand, well, in this theory, management assumes employees are ambitious, self-motivated, anxious to accept greater responsibility and exercise self-control and self-direction. It is believed that employees enjoy their mental and physical work activities. It is also believed that employees have the desire to be imaginative and creative in their jobs if given the chance. There is an opportunity for greater productivity by giving employees the space and freedom to be at their best. A Theory Y manager will lead their employees and adopt a facilitative style as they try to remove the barriers that prevent workers from fully actualizing their true potential. A Theory Y manager believes that given the right conditions, most people will want to do well at work and that there is a pool of unused creativity in the workforce. They believe that the satisfaction of doing a good job is a strong motivation in and of itself. All right, you may say, that's all good and well, but how on earth am I supposed to remember all of this for the PMP exam? Well, there's a very simple trick here. Let's draw two smiley faces together. Yes, a circle with eyes and nose and mouth like you've done as a child to memorize X and Y. So for theory X, we draw a circle. And then for the nose, we have a dash. And for the two eyes, we have two X's. And for our mouth, we also have an X. For theory Y, again, we draw a circle. We have two O's for the eyes, a dash for the nose, and a Y for the mouth. And voila, 
Theory X is a frowny face, lots of X's there, and Theory Y is a smiley face, with the Y at the bottom there making the smile. These two pictures, they should really go on your brain dump sheet as you prepare for your exam. This is a very easy and simple way to remember the differences between Theory X and Theory Y. And we are moving on to the last letter in the alphabet, which is either the letter Z or Z, depending on where in the world you come from and how you prefer to pronounce this one. In any way, Theory Z builds on the ideas from Theory X and Y. It focuses on increasing employee loyalty to the company by providing a job for life with a strong focus on the well-being on the employee, both on the job and off the job. Management that believes in Theory Z tends to promote stable employment, high productivity, and also high employee morale and satisfaction. Note that this theory is also associated with Maslow, but it is attributed to the so-called Japanese management style, which is credited to Dr. William Ochi. Next, we have the expectancy theory of Victor Room that deals with motivation and management. Room's expectancy theory assumes that behavior results from conscious choices among alternatives. Expectancy theory is about the mental processes about this choice, as well as the process of choosing. We are motivated by outcome. For instance, it would be natural to want to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. Room realized that an employee's performance is also based on individual factors such as personalities, skills and abilities, knowledge and experience as well as abilities. His expectancy theory proposes that motivation has three factors, namely expectancy, where you determine whether the effort required will actually lead to high performance. Instrumentality, where you ask yourself, will a good performance or reaching a goal lead to a specific outcome? And valence, which relates to whether you find the outcomes desirable. In other words, how much do you really want the reward or hate a punishment. So your motivation is the product of all these factors in combination. If one is off, for example, if a reward is insufficient or you don't think that hard work will pay off, then you won't be as motivated. For the exam, you're unlikely to be asked about the technical names of these factors. It's sufficient to know them as effort, performance and reward. Let me give you an example. Imagine that you were a salesman who is given an unrealistic sales target. You are promised a plaque on the wall with your name on it if you meet your sales target. You don't really trust management and doubt that they will give you the plaque since there are no plaques on anyone else's wall either. And even if they did, you don't really care to have your name on the wall. In contrast, imagine if you were a salesman in another organization. You have been given training and the list of potential customers. You are confident that if you work hard and reach your sales goal for a month, you can get a cash bonus. You've made friends with another salesman who got a cash bonus last year to fund a holiday trip, and you are keen to do the same. Can you sense the difference in motivation here? Expectancy theory explains why you'd have a very low motivation in one case where you knew no matter how much effort you put into it, it was like a mission impossible for a reward that you don't only not care for, but you're not even sure if it really exists. On the other hand, you would have high motivation if you are given an attainable goal, where if you reach it, you believe that you'll get the award that you truly value. And by the way, before we move on, let me point out that out of all of these theories, X, Y, Z, expectancy theory, Maslow, Hertzberg, and Victor Room right here, you can expect to find about one to two questions in total on your exam. 
Now we are moving on to Hertzberg's theory of motivators and hygiene factors. In 1959, he constructed a theory of factors affecting people's attitudes about work. Let's first discuss this half of his theory, the hygiene factors. According to the theory, the absence of these hygiene factors can create job dissatisfaction, but their presence does not necessarily motivate or create satisfaction. Hygiene factors would include things such as a company policy, supervision, interpersonal relations, working conditions, and salary. For instance, the worst job in the world will not give you satisfaction even if it pays you a million Australian dollars a month. Yes, when I first pay you that million dollars, wow, what a great motivator, but over time, hey, remember, this is the worst job in the world. Just because I'm getting that kind of money, that's not satisfying. That's not motivating. So over time, the money, the salary will simply be there and it's not motivating any longer. In contrast, he determined from the data that the motivators were elements that enriched a person's job. He found five factors in particular that were strong determinants of job satisfaction. This included such things as achievement, recognition, responsibility, advancement, and the work itself. These motivators were associated with long-term positive effects in job performance, while the hygiene factors consistently produced only short-term changes in job attitudes and performance, which quickly fell back to their previous levels, as we have seen in my example with the salary. Next, we have fringe benefits and perks. These are various compensations provided to employees in addition to their normal salaries. These would include things like daycare, training, or education. These fringe benefits are not only for the employee, but indirectly may also benefit the company, the employer as well. For example, a daycare near the workplace might enable an employee to work more hours. Training and educating the employee will enable Enable them to do a better job. There could also be discounts or medical benefits. I want to point out that fringe benefits may also change over time. For example, the organization may offer movie tickets at 50% discount to its employees one year, but may offer a different set of discounts next year. Same with medical benefits. It is not uncommon for employers to revisit and change providers or provide different offerings every year. And lastly, profit sharing. Though not as common as some other fringe benefits, this provides additional incentive for employees to perform well. So in summary, fringe benefits that we see here are the things that every employee expects to get above their salary. What to expect varies with different countries, industries and individual organizations. And then the colloquial perk is really a shortened version of the more formal term, perquisite. A perquisite, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, is a privilege, gain or profit incidental to regular salary or wages, especially one expected or promised. As this definition states, it is more discretionary in nature. These perks are the things that not everyone gets. Often perks are given to employees who are doing notably well or have some kind of seniority. Common perks include maybe a company car, maybe even with a chauffeur, VIP parking spots, hotel stays or a membership to a golf club. And lastly, there is the halo effect, which refers to a cognitive bias where the assessment of one of the qualities of an individual serves to influence and bias the judgment of other qualities of this individual. This translates into how we perceive certain qualities in a person. For example, appearance can be a big factor. To that point, beauty 
equates to ability. Attractive people are often judged as having a more desirable personality and more skills than someone of just normal or average appearance. That is why celebrities are often used to endorse products. Even if they have no particular expertise or skills to evaluate how good the product really is. Another way to say this is that you may think that a person who is good at X must be good at Y. So let's say if she is good at driving a car, well then she must also be good at teaching how to drive a car. This may be the belief even if the two items or the two qualities are completely unrelated. Let's review. We covered quite a bit of material here, so let's see what we have learned. We learned about where the power lies in functional, matrixed or projectized organizations. We learned that the tight matrix has nothing to do with the matrix management structure. It just means co-location. We also learned about various numbers. We talked about five or really six sources of organizational power. We talked about the three main reasons of conflict and four ways to avoid conflict. We also learned about the five conflict resolution techniques, the five stages of team development, as well as the five levels in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And based on what we covered in this lesson, you can now figure out if you are a theory X, Y or Z manager, or if you follow more the expectancy theory there as an employee. We also found out the difference between the motivators and hygiene factors, as well as the difference between fringe benefits and perks. And, of course, you found out that the halo effect doesn't really have anything to do with angels at all. That is the material that we had to cover on human resources management theory. Now on to some example questions. And our first PMP exam sample question reads as follows. Which of the following is considered a motivational factor according to Hertzberg's motivation hygiene theory? Is it A. Salary, B. Job security, C. Personal relations, or D. Recognition? The correct answer is, of course, D recognition. According to Hertzberg's motivation hygiene theory, motivational factors give positive satisfaction arising from the intrinsic conditions of the job itself, such as recognition, achievement or personal growth. And here is our second PMP exam sample question. Carol's team consists of people from different locations. Initially, she had a lot of problems. Each team member was working independently. Two months later, the team members are starting to work together and adjusting their work habits and behaviors. In which stage of the team development is Carol's team currently engaged? A. Performing B. Forming C. Norming or D. Storming The correct answer is that Carol's team is currently in C, norming. The team members are in the third stage of team development. It is a time of less tension within the team, but the team is still going through a period of change and adjustment. And our third and final PMP exam sample question is this here. Which of the following techniques can reduce the amount of conflict? A. The Human Resource Management Plan B. Team Ground Rules C. Performance Appraisals or D. An Employee of the Month Cash Prize The answer is B. Team Ground Rules When people know where they stand, there are just fewer conflicts. The cash prize, well, may even lead to more conflict if people start thinking, why did he get that cash prize three months in a row? The human resource plan there and performance appraisals, they really have nothing to do with conflict management. Also, the human resource management plan is a document and not a technique. Team ground rules, on the other hand, they set the tone for how your team will work together and may help that fewer conflicts arise. 
And with that, we have come to the end of this lesson. So it's time for Justine to say... Have a lovely day. And I say, until next time.